Hi, welcome to Lean Blog Interviews. I'm Mark Graben. Our guests today joining us from Australia are two of the three co-authors of the upcoming book titled Leading Excellence, Five Hats of the Adaptive Leader. So we're joined today by Brad Jevons, who's been on the podca podcast before, and Stephen Dargan. Uh, the third co-author for the book is Chris Butterworth, and uh, the book should be available or will be available in August, I should say. And uh, the Kindle version, even right now, as we're recording this in the middle of May, um, the Kindle version can be pre-ordered on Amazon. So, um, Stephen, I'll, I'll say first, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Thanks, Mark. It's uh, lovely to be here. And uh, obviously, it's six o'clock in the morning over here, so I've had my coffee and ready to go. Yeah. So, thank Bright you. Early. Appreciate you taking me. Bright and early, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm glad you had your coffee. My morning coffee is worn off as it's 6 p.m. Eastern. Hopefully I'm not <laughs> too brain dead or uh, tired at the end of the day, but I think this will be a lively discussion, and um, so I'm looking forward to it. And uh, Brad, I'll say welcome back to the podcast. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Great to be back on the show, mate, and thanks for the opportunity to chat on this book. As you know, we're writing a book's a labor of love, and it's mm -hmm. great to get out there. Yeah, well, you're almost... Uh, almost at, uh, at launch. So um, a lot of the hard work is done, more, more hard work ahead, but you're, yeah. you're, you're almost there. So I'm excited for you both. Um, let me read a little bit of, about the bios of the authors. Um, uh, first off, Chris Butterworth is a multi-award winning author, international speaker, and Shingo faculty fellow. I saw some pictures. I know he was at the Shingo conference in Orlando uh, last week. Uh, Chris is co-author of uh, three Shingo Publication Award-winning books, Four Plus One, Embedding a Culture of Continuous Improvement, The Essence of Excellence. And this is an interesting title. If Chris was here, maybe I'll get him some other time. I would ask him about this title. Why bother with a question mark? Why and how to assess your continuous improvement culture? Uh, mm -hmm. Stephen Dargan, uh, also who is joining us here, uh, has uh, he's a, a diverse and inclusive, customer-centric, driven, transformational leader with 20-plus years of leadership experience spanning Australia and Europe. Stephen is a Shingo Institute alumni, a Shingo facilitator and examiner. He's a graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors and is a certified Lean Six Sigma Black Belt. And then Brad Jevons is a senior leadership coach focused on helping improve uh, leaders and their organizations, helping them create a better future economically, socially, and environmentally for future generations. So that maybe answers the question, why bother? Yeah, it's about <laughs> how, do we, how do we make things better, isn't it? But why, why bother is very much on that, you know, why bother to do all this too? And why bother to do that effort to make it, you know, better in that regard? Yeah. So, and we'll, we'll come back and talk about why bother writing a book, <laughs> but that's a good, <laughs> good challenge and a good thing to tackle. But uh, Brad is host of the Enterprise Excellent podcast. I've been a guest um, and he's author of the book, Agile Sales, Delivering Customer Journeys of Value and Delight. And we, we probably talked about that three years ago, feels like last month. And it also yeah. feels like 20 years ago. Yeah, for sure, Mark. It goes quick, doesn't it? Well, especially in these times, so. Yeah. Uh, but that was episode 416, uh, June of 2021. Um, so in that episode, I had asked Brad about his lean origin story, and we might get the short version in a minute. Uh, but first off, Stephen, I, I was going to put you on the spot here. If you can tell us, you know, how, how, what was your lean origin story? How, where? when, why, you know, did you get introduced to this and why is it so important to you? Oh, Mark, it's, it's, it's like a game of two halves with me, Mark. I think uh, for, for half of my career, I've been leading large sales teams across, you know, many different uh, industries um, in, in Ireland and moved to Australia back in 2010 as an economic refugee post GFC. So uh -huh. tried a new, tried a new lifestyle in Perth and, managed to get into uh, into financial services here in Australia. And when I did, again, I was back into the old, you know, tasked with setting up businesses or going in and turning businesses around. But then I was, in 2013, I was lucky enough to get involved with um, doing my Lean Six Sigma Black Belt and got introduced to Shigeo Shingo and his teachings and, mm. and Chris Butterworth. And that's where we first met. And Chris became... 
almost my mentor for for the last 11 years on on all things continuous improvement and mindsets and behaviors so uh, it, it's it's like a step change in my career because i i, I found my purpose mark and it, it was mm. something that really drove me forward so ever since 2013 i've been you know beating the drum on mindsets behaviors and particularly on leadership behaviors and it's something i'm really really passionate about and you know, seeing the true potential in every single individual is one thing that drives me forward. So writing this book was always on the agenda. And Chris and I have always spoken about doing a, um, in fact, you mentioned Why Bother. In fact, we had a title, Why Bother in the Financial Services. Um, uh-huh. uh, but, but we never got around to writing that book. And we just, you know, lots of lots of learnings along the way. You know, I, I applied for a Shingo Prize and it's probably probably one of the, my greatest failures I cherish most, most in that we didn't get the prize. But mm. the learnings we got from that kind of we brought forward and, and, and you know, step step change and improvements in what I'm doing now. So um, the opportunity was there to write the book and uh, I just grasped, grasped it with two hands. And Chris then introduced me to Brad and, and we just, yeah, it just evolved very quickly. And yeah. just three, three of us had like-minded attitudes and it was one thing that we all just were really passionate about. So it just flowed from there. Mm-hmm. I don't know much about financial services. What would be some of the answer to why bother with lean what? and financial services? Well, you know, well, well financial, business challenges or yeah, why financial services particularly? Mark is is pretty much widget driven. Like you know, it's a it's a it's a large customer focused, uh, customer centric business. Yet yet most organizations in the financial services don't think of their customer. They just think of um, processing widgets through uh, through queues and through mm-hmm. service level agreements with with no focus on the true customer experience. Mm-hmm. So um, why bother? Why bother when you come around to why bother doing assessments and maturity assessments? There's not too many financial services companies worldwide that have embr- that have embraced the Shingo principles and moving forward uh, mm-hmm. with those because. So I think uh, we were one of the first, I think Commonwealth Bank Group in Australia were the first Shingo Prize winners of silver medallion. And I think it was 2015, Mark, that they got a silver medallion for for one of their collections and recovery centers. And they've seen a huge, a huge uh, shift in their customer experience and obviously their cost base and colleague engagement. Um, We were the first ones in Western Australia to go uh, on a Shingo journey and you know, taking a business that was underperforming, um, just ticking along to global best in class within three years was was probably one of my proudest moments as a leader. Mm. And you talk about you know kind of the, the the shift in your career or being introduced to lean eleven years ago. It probably makes you think about times before learning about lean, and you know what might have been, or it probably helps you better navigate helping others kind of come around and make the same leap that you did i think i think for me uh, mark well, i was i was always a leader that always was trying to find a better way of doing things mm-hmm. uh, and when i moved to australia i was tasked with setting up a few um a couple of business functions um, and in that and that's how i ended up in the lean side because the the commonwealth bank at the time and uh, back in 2000 well, 2013, we went on a, a really aggressive uh, productivity journey. Part of that journey was that they would take senior leaders out of their out of their functions, uh, functional roles, and train them up to be Lean Six Sigma black belts. And then the idea was they would place them back in those roles to drive that mindset and behaviors through their through the fabric of that organization or or their function. And I was lucky enough to be one of those leaders to to, to be selected. Um, so I was always a leader that really kind of always tried to make tomorrow better than today for both our customers, but more importantly, our, our, our colleagues, mm-hmm. our frontline people, because they're the ones that are, are delivering the experience to customers. So I was always had that kind of natural ability to, to, to want to be better. Yeah. And I've, I've found, I mean, what your story makes me think of is, you know, leaders who get exposed to lean and they get excited and they hear, here's some language, here's some frameworks like this, the, you know, it feels very comfortable, intuitive of like, well, this is how I was trying to lead. And now maybe there's some other tools or methods that, that help you better down that path that you were already, you know, where, where you were already leading that way. Yeah. With those yeah. And then and look, yeah, and, and I think, you know, I'm yes, I am a Lean Six Sigma black belt through University of Cardiff and SA Partners, but I'm not, 
you know, I'm not a purist at the at the heart of when it comes to lean, and and, and that's why I think I was really passionate about writing this book. I wanted to, we we three of us wanted to get a book that wasn't theory based uh, and mm-hmm. and was applicable to every single leader, regardless of you know what capability you have, where you're whether you're an aspiring leader or an existing leader, whether you're in the corporate world, sporting world, or even in the non for profit mm-hmm. world. It's it's a it's a book that it's it's not even a book. It's a it's a manual. It's a practical guide um, mm-hmm. to help leaders uh, improve, you know, their own their own um, mindsets, and behaviors, but also that of their teams and the people around them. And and Brad, maybe I'll I'll, I'll bring you in here, and we'll, we'll talk more about the book when. Um, when Stephen's saying, well, it's not a book. Well, it is. But it, what, what I hear you saying, or uh, maybe Brad elaborate, it's not a book that you just read and then put aside. It, it sounds like more of a a guide that you would work your way through in different ways. Tell, Brad, tell us a little bit more about the structure of the book. Yeah, we frame it up, Mark, with the, the key concepts we've worked on at the start. And then it really goes into real life applications right there because there's a lot of case studies in that section where we're bringing in the frameworks we talk to. And then the rest of the book really goes into heavily, you know, in the field, experiential, you know, how do you apply it? How do you do it? Case studies galore across many key aspects. Mm -hmm. And it's very much that book that is about the critical part that leaders play in actually achieving a lean journey or an excellence journey. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've really worked to do. But at the same time, we've partnered with a lot of the award-winning leaders, both in sport and also business, to really get their stories. And what's funny with it, Mark, is how much of it just lines up. You know, it's not like you had to, you didn't even have to alter anything. You know, it's not like you had to try to tweak it to bolt it in. It mm-hmm. was what they did was just best practice leadership. And mm-hmm. that was a beautiful thing. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back uh, to that. and We're going to take a dive into the book and, and and Brad, maybe I can give you this opportunity to to tell whatever version of the lean origin story that you would want to tell. You know, maybe uh, listeners are new to the podcast; they didn't hear you three years ago. Go ahead, go ahead and tell your story and you know how that's different than Stevens. Well, I think I think the interesting one, Mark, is this, is a bit of the similarity. Around that same time, I also connected with Chris Butterworth and the mission I was on with a company, which was Signet and the Winston Group at the time, was how do we make transformation stick how do we make lean stick and sustain Mm -hmm. for the longer term and i got connected with uh chris and also peter hines dr peter hines and both of those guys became really mentors to me same story as darks they just helped us so much and so i guess i'd come forward to now and it's just such an honor to write a book like this with chris it's Mm -hmm. a bit of a pinch yourself type moment (laughs) and uh but my journey also went into the world of agile heavily too as you know Mark from us talking in the past and mm-hmm. that is just really lean applied to the technology world you know it's it's there's so much overlap Jeff Sutherland the creator of it basically open, openly says that he, he studied yeah. I know he studied all that and created that path and I think that position out of that agile world brought a key concept to us about the book that one of the key aspects in the scrum guide or in anything to do with agile is about leaders who serve and if you go that element of leaders who serve, it was that foundational piece that we went, right, this is, that's, if there's one key ingredient, that's the key ingredient to sustaining an excellence journey is mm. leaders who serve yeah. and the shadow they cast. And so that's sort of then what brought us this, this place here. And I was having dinner with Chris, I don't know, two, three years ago now. And I said, Chris, we need someone to stand up and write a book on this place because, you know, there's a lot of one hit wonder type leadership books which are great you know Mm -hmm. they're good you know but no one's really done thing in recent times apart from dogs i was thinking of legacy you know like what james kerr did where that is comprehensive but it's written Mm -hmm. purely from a rugby position i think that's one book that really covers what do we need to do as leaders Mm. but um yeah i was talking to chris and i said i got this idea on leading excellence i think it's a great name i think someone needs to write a book that is more comprehensive on the position of leadership and then Chris yeah. ran with it, dragged me in, and then brought Dargs in. And oh, sorry, Stephen. And uh, <laughs> it's just that's Stephen's nickname, everyone. Yeah. So if you hear me slip, um, <laughs> but it's um, it was just amazing the knowledge that got contributed 
Like to me, it was just the epitome of teamwork. You know, right back in uni, I was studying Toyota and the power of teams over the individual. You know, and and I just saw it play out this book, and it was it was awesome. Yeah. Um, so talk about the book, and you know, the book. You you've already started touching on it. You know, the book is a countermeasure, if you will, to different problems and challenges out there. You know, so to to dig in the problem statements a little bit. You know, in the, the, the book, one thing you write about is employee engagement statistics. And you know, this seems to be a global problem where, um, you know, measured and I mean, it's not inaccurate measurement. It's really just the experience of um, what employees are facing leads to disengagement, very low engagement. Um, what, what are some of the factors um, that that you I, you've identified and that you write about about why engagement is so low and, and and that's not even just a new problem. I think Doug, you're right. If I take this one, mate, on like with so with that Gallup survey, Mark, it was just mm -hmm. an eye opener again because we see it in what Dargs and Chris and I have done assessing organisations, helping organisations. We, we call it the leadership shadow, right? We can see this leadership shadow when it's strong, there's great. When it's not strong, there's weakness. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the, we had our sort of theories on what we we're seeing and we combined that. But then you look at the Gallup survey and they just said the same thing. Main contributor was the lived experience with your direct leader. Mm -hmm. That was like number one is my experience with my direct leader or manager. And then the other contributing factor that we've really put forward that we've seen and they've also seen is that do I have a meaningful goal and do I feel like I can make a difference at work? Mm -hmm. Or am I just showing up to work to punch out widgets? Yeah. And that's the two key contributing factors. And that became the basis of the whole book really was, okay, well, how do we do this? Because the other statistics that's, that's interesting you look at the companies that are the highest performing, fasting, fastest growing in the world, they nail high engagement scores. Like their mm -hmm. engagement scores are off the charts. Why? Because every employee is moving the company forward. Yeah. Every employee, in the, well, not, I shouldn't say every, but a lot of the employees in those companies have a meaningful goal. They feel they can make a difference. They're chasing towards it. They've got good leadership practices in there that are focused on growing people's capability and they're nailing it. And then you go, the ones that, aren't performing so well they've got low engagement there's one caveat in here mm -hmm. and i believe that caveat is where you've got like a bit of a monopoly type of situation yeah. you know like such a scale of business that their momentum is so big that their culture and this position they still make money despite it but i don't know if that's going to sustain into the future we're seeing a number of those goliaths struggle and I think that will just get worse as we go forward if they don't lean into this type of piece that mm -hmm. other companies have succeeded with in such a big way. Yeah. And and Brad, maybe you um, or Stephen, feel free to jump in at any point. Uh, talk more about the leadership shadow. That's that's an interesting phrase. If you can kind of elaborate on that in both, you know, the positive shadow that's cast or times when that shadow causes problems. I'll let you go, Dogs. Oh, look, you know, when you look at the leadership um, and what, what it takes to be an effective leader, I mean, it, the shadow is, is really important because they, they, what, what, they, what they do, what they say, what they, what they coach, their actions, their words transpires across the whole organization. And when you, if you look at a couple of the case studies that we have in the book, there was one particular case study where... Um, as a financial services organization and, and you know the, the the team the team was was pretty much at a low uh, just tipping along uh, and a simple system of reward and recognition that was put in place the leader came in um, every single morning and their shadow was to go and spend time walking around the floor saying hello to every single person that was there on the floor and not just saying hello to them but actually connecting to them to, to you know what was going on in their own personal lives but the second ritual that they would do every day, Mark, was they would simply take the customer experience feedback from the previous day. They would look at they would look at the um, feedback and they would 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 understand what was the, who was the colleague that dealt with that particular customer. And then you know, Brad mentions about connecting to a, a, a higher purpose, but 
the leader would then send them an email or physically go and thank them for, you know, connecting to the purpose for delivering that brilliant customer experience. Um, and that simple recognition, it's not necessarily about the reward, but that simple shadow of recognition, every single day ritual uh, that was done started to permeate the whole organization and the whole leadership function then underneath, which was about 28 leaders, I think at the time, all started to do the same behaviors every single day. Mm. So it almost created this environment of, of you know, reward, re sorry, re recognition and, and, you know, connecting people to the overall organization's vision and purpose. It's simple repetition, reinforcement, Mark, um, leadership behaviors um, that really drives, because, you, you know, people look up to the leader. They, they, they see and watch, they emulate everything the leader does. You know, so if you're a leader that just is, you know, cares about themselves and not, not cares about their people and, you know, not cares about their organization and just tries to, you know, uh, play the political game in an organization, they're mm -hmm. going to get found out very, very quickly by their people. Mm -hmm. Their people won't follow them. But if you're an authentic leader and you're, you know, you're, you're vulnerable and you've got that humility as a leader and you've got that shadow and you, of care and respect for your people, then people will start to follow you. Right. Yeah. Because that's that's a reflection of those behaviors, mm. correct? Of, of of the leaders or the, the leaders they see every day or at least frequently. Yeah, Mark. There's an interesting case study I've got. We've got on it too. With um, in Australia, there's a super coach called Wayne Bennett. His stats mm -hmm. are unbelievable. Like rival anyone in the world as a leader and coach, and he has one simple sa saying, which is "talks cheap." Mm -hmm. It's what people you see you do and how you make them feel that counts. Yeah. Yeah. And he lives by that, you know, and that's that shadow. You know, it's like, well, what behaviors do we exude to cast a shadow to actually inspire people and make them f feel inspired, but then also help them grow and yeah. become the best they can become? Yeah. So in the US, we say you've got to walk the talk. I, I was in Quebec last week and I learned they have more of an expression, the, f the feet have to follow the lips. Yeah. I don't know. Is there, is there an Aussie way of saying that that's even different once more or would you say walk the talk also it's we'd no walk the talk no both of them okay. uh it's just you know do what you say is probably a very common saying here mm -hmm. um yeah. yeah so it's yeah it's it's simple stuff isn't it but i think the challenge that we've all got is we've all got a challenge of habit mm. and i think the biggest challenge with our habit is typically our habits are programmed to serve ourselves you know mm -hmm. like we are wired to do things that make us feel good and provide us that positive feedback and experience and that can but really with to be a leader who serves it's about our behavior is about truly serving that the growth of the other person yeah and and it's not easy i, I think I, I know i can think of i could probably think of a million occasions where i've served my behavior rather than serving the other person mm -hmm. and i think that's the biggest challenge that we're all facing to truly get excellence out of an organization yeah. And I'm trying to think where to go next. There, I mean, there's the, 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 such a rich yeah, topic exactly. and, and like, man, I'm going to, I'm going to hold that topic of uh, servant leadership maybe to, to later, even though that might be a common thread in what we're talking about. But I want to go back a little bit and, you know, hear your thoughts. You know, when, when I, when I hear this phrase employee engagement, or you know, people lamenting that the engagement is low. Like we're, we're all authors here, so let's talk words. Um, you know, engagement is, in a way, it's a noun. That's the that's the thing we're measuring. How much engagement is there? I, I I think there's an old habit where leaders might blame those employees for not being engaged. I'm like, I don't think it works that way. Like engaging others. Now now we're at a verb. You know, engaging, actively engaging leads to engagement. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm oversimplifying it, but I'm, no. I'm, cur I'm curious what, what you think about, you know, the, the behaviors that, um, that you've seen that, that lead to that result of an engaged workforce. Well, for me, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here, uh, Brad, but I mean, just from my experience, you know, and those people who know me know I'm not a fan of, engagements annual engagement surveys because they're they're a lagging metric and mm -hmm. 
sometimes generally they're used for senior leadership to make them feel closer to their people. But in fact, if you are a true leader who serves, you should know how engaged your people are because you've created a safe, safe psychological safe place for them to speak up and make a difference. So, you know, when I look at um, when I look at you know why people, you know, if you look at the mining industry in Australia, for argument's sake, the the recent core logic data suggests that thirty percent of people leave the mining industry or they might leave their employer because of ineffective development planning. Um, and we see that quite a lot, right? When you don't develop your people to, to their true potential, um, they leave the organization or they get disengaged. An example that we have in the, in the book is, you know, uh, contact centers, right? Contact centers are generally the poor cousin of any organization, right? They, they're not treated with the, their entry level roles. They're not treated with the same level of respect. But yet, you know, they touch... They touch the most number of customers every single day, and you know, right. upwards right. of thousands of customers a day. So I, I classify them as the heartbeat of your organization. Yeah. So when when you get individuals that come in to be contact center roles, you know, I I, I try to say to them, you're you're not just a contact center agent. You have the massive potential to appreciate and value in this organization. So what is it that you really want to do in three years' time as an individual? Do you want to be in contact center? That's fine if you do. Or do you want to go and develop into product development? Or do you want to go into change management or, or finance department or any different, you know, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of different roles in any organization. And if you, if you have a leader who truly understands that and shows the way, almost like gives them the guiding pathway to all these different pathways as such, um, their eyes start to light up because they're no longer seen as an entry level role or the poor cousin of the organization. So when you start to create a really strong development system um, from your entry level roles, you start to become the nursery of really good, strong talent mm -hmm. across the organization. So you no longer get seen as entry level. You're seen as the, as the, the golden goose mm -hmm. that lays the golden egg for the organization. And then, be, you know, especially when you create really strong systems, then you have, you can identify gaps of capability gaps across your organization and go, hang on, we need people in coding, for argument's sake, because it's a future skills gap. Okay, well, let's look at the contact center. Is there any people in the contact center that we can actually develop through into those particular roles? So I think, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's that, that when you start to get people and start to develop people through for their true potential, you get them to come to work each day, their true authentic selves, but also giving 110% uh, commitment. That coupled with the reward and recognition system, as I spoke about earlier, um, as well as, you know, um, keeping them fully engaged in, in what they're doing. Obviously, obviously, as well, people come to work as well, not to just do work. They love to affect change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so a supporting continuous improvement framework, allowing them to ideate and, and change new things and, and make things better tomorrow than they are today. And, you know, celebrate failure as learnings and, you know, mm -hmm. no longer slap on the wrist for making mistakes. So when you start yeah. to create the culture, um, engagement levels will follow. Your attrition rate will fall, will fall dramatically. Your unplanned sick leave, which is the greatest barometer, unplanned sick leave is the greatest lever. Mm -hmm. of lead, it's a leading metric to, right. you know, a, 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 a poor performing culture. So, yeah, I could, Mark, very passionate about that particular subject, so I could mm -hmm. talk for hours on it. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think we have enough of the podcast. <laughs> well, we could always do another episode and uh, <laughs> dig deeper in, into some of these topics. But I mean, you, you touched on a couple of topics that are incredibly important to me. One is the ability to learn from failures and mistakes. And I think a foundation of being able to do that is, as you mentioned, psychological safety. And you know, I think you gave the right definition of it. it, it, it if you feel safe to speak up, you are feeling a sense of psychological safety. And we want more of that. We have more participation, more improvement. Um, but you know, I'm curious, some of your thoughts or um, lessons around uh, the behaviors that help cultivate psychological safety, cultivate engagement. Maybe there's a lot of overlap there, but... There is, there is a lot of overlap. And I think it was well, it's back to the previous comment about leader, leadership shadow, okay? Mm -hmm. So... You know, back to the, 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 you know, the Edward Demings of this world and 95% of people come to work each day to do a good job. 5%, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 95%, it's, 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 it's 95% of the defects are, are in the system or process. 
never blame people, blame process is my mantra. So if people make mistakes, go leaders should be going to look at, well, how does that mistake actually happen in the first place? Right. What was the system or process that led to that? Did we not train them effectively? Did we put too much pressure on their environment? Was the environment for that individual, uh, whether that be intrinsic or extrinsic interference around that individual? And, and there's a formula for high performance in the book, which um, we, we won't go through today. We, we can touch on today, but you know, is there intrinsic or extrinsic interference sort of surrounding that individual? Um, so don't jump to you know blaming the person mm-hmm. because generally, so generally, ninety-five percent of the time, it's something that we have done wrong as a leader. Yeah, and we haven't supported those individuals, and we haven't served them well enough. Um, so I think that's that's how you start to create psychological safety when you start to have that leadership shadow of never blaming people, blame process, and going mm-hmm. to seeking to understand and help me solve this. You know, we made this error, right? Let's learn from it. Let's celebrate the failure and what do we learn from it uh, and make sure. And that's when you start to do that, your shadow and then your leaders all start to do that. That also starts to create that psychological safe place to speak up. Yeah. Because uh, back to habits and leadership habits, a lot of leaders I think have been taught or they seem to have figured out that, well, you know, they'll say we have to punish mistakes. Otherwise, that's giving permission to make more. And like, well, if you don't share the mindset that that you articulated, Stephen, and I feel very formal calling you Stephen now that I've learned <laughs> that you have a nickname, but I'm going to go with Stephen. Um, uh, oh, and I sidetracked myself uh, with with that side comment. Uh, that's what happens at the end of the day. But we're talking about uh, oh, right. So you have a choice, though. Like if in, if, if they don't share that mindset of you know most everybody wants to do good work. They want to do quality work. They want to have pride in their work, as Dr. Deming would have said. Well, no, people aren't like, if if it was an intentional, um, you know, if it was an intentional act, that's not a mistake. There's a different word for that. Sorry that that got so garbled in my attempt to both make a comment and uh, joke around, but yeah, but, 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 but yeah, yeah, again, you know, if you go and start to look at the interference, right? So generally some people are, you know, make mistakes, right? So, and some could be delivered, but generally, generally speaking, you know, there's, I classified again in the book, there's, there's, there's three different, there's a couple of different um, scenarios where the individual's purpose is not aligned to the organization's purpose. So, you know, it, when when somebody is not connected to the overall organization's purpose on a, on a completely different path, well, generally their behaviors are going to be quite different, um, and they're harder to change. So they're they're you know that's when you you may need to use your coaching hat to you know put on the coaching hat to go okay, this organization may not be for you, Mark. So you know what is it what is it that re, what is your core purpose and what is you what are you aligned to and what's your true north and then let's work with you to try and understand what are the best types of industries or roles that best suits you and i've done that before um and people have come back to me and they've left the you know financial services industry and found a niche in some other industry and have come back and thanked me for actually you know helping them see where they should be should be as, as a person um very very rarely people go in to deliberately do work uh, do bad things in work very very rarely right. um generally if somebody makes an error or mistake there's something going on and i talk about in the mm-hmm. book about Everybody in this world, Mark, has some form of interference in their lives, no matter who you are. And that interference is broken up into two things. It's either intrinsic interference, so things they're grappling with, whether that be mental health issues, you know, lack of self-confidence, afraid to speak up, um, mm-hmm. you know, anxiety, depression, all those type of things that stop people being their true authentic selves and work. And then you got your in- extrinsic interference, which is you know things that happen externally in the environment. You know, their leader putting a lot of pressure on them, uh, production over safety concerns, uh, domestic violence, financial abuse. Uh, you know, I, I myself had my own interference when I was you know back in when I was a general manager of a financial services organization. I had a sixteen-year-old teenage son who was quite difficult at the time, and those who mm-hmm. have teenagers. Can can resonate that we myself and my wife were arguing all the time and almost mm-hmm. like dro- drove a wedge. Now he's come good, thankfully, at the end of it as they normally do. Yeah. But that was the external interference for me, and that was you know hard to deal with at the particular time, as well as some inter- internal interference that I had. So generally, as leaders, though we in the old command and control ar- uh, architectures of organizations, 
we you know if someone's behavior or performance tips, we generally go and put them on a performance improvement plan or slap a coaching plan on them without truly understanding the context and the environment that that person is working within. So mm. I, try, I try coach leaders to try and understand the intrinsic or extrinsic interference first. And then, you know, if you can try and identify that, then what I like to call, use the term, you dance with that interference. You put support mechanisms in place to help that individual. And when you do that, you start to create that psychological safe place again. And, mm. you know, performance starts to shift and you, you feel that you're, 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 your frontline person or your your staff member starts to feel more connected um, and will work harder, not because you ask them to, because they want to. Yeah. And that makes me think of some good general lean thinking about not jumping the countermeasures, the performance improvement plan, the PIP, or whatever yeah. coaching or whatever disciplinary process. Like, do we really understand? I, I appreciate, Stephen, that you're talking through the, the causes and root causes and contributing factors. Make sure we understand that first. Yeah, we, we also send them back into, you know, um, an organization or system that has probably 60% waste built up into the system. Mm -hmm. As you know, Mark, and most businesses have upwards of 60% waste and failure demand, as I, I, like, I like to call it. So, yeah. you know, as leaders, you know, I'm not a fan of one-to-ones. You know, the, the typical one-to-one -one is, you know, what did we do well last month? What are we, what are we going to do next month type of conversation? Um, yet then we're sending them back into a system that's fundamentally broken. So, mm -hmm. you know, the way I like to do my one-to-ones is let's go and look at, you know, your working environment and how do we improve that? What, how do we improve the systems that you're working in uh, to make them more effective and efficient uh, so that you're coming to work each day to enjoy yourself and, 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 and improve? Yeah. So, Brad, let me maybe turn it over to you and come back to this, um, this word serve. So we might think of servant leadership or other ways of describing that. In the book, what, what do you and you know, the uh, co-authors mean by leaders who serve? Why is that so important right now? Yes, yeah, so I think like, the easiest way I can describe it is to add the extra words on the back of it, which is leaders who serve the growth of others. Mm. And that's mm -hmm. as simply put, you know, is my behavior serving the growth of others or is it serving myself or something else, you know, and there's a lot of external extrinsic forces coming down on leaders that can easily turn them to a place where they're purely serving other factors mm -hmm. versus really focusing on serving the growth of people, which ultimately then serves the growth of everything else. You know, it's like this fulfilling type of position. Mm -hmm. And what we write about in the book is it links back, like the, the legend of this space originates with, Ken Blanchard with his work mm -hmm. on situational leadership. You know, mm -hmm. what we've done now, which really comes from Dargs's work and what he's just shared, is that we believe that leaders nowadays just need to get good at pausing, controlling their emotions, mm -hmm. number one, mm -hmm. pausing, looking at the person, and the bit that we've altered is we believe they need to think about the context surrounding them. Like it's not just, not just the situation, mm -hmm. you know, we need to think about the context surrounding, which includes what's going on, but it also includes everything else Dargs just spoke about mm -hmm. and more. So that's sort of the evolution of it that we've added is that to be a leader who serves, the one thing we've got to be good at is controlling our emotions, just make sure we stay in conscious thought mm -hmm. and then look at the person, think of the context surrounding them mm -hmm. and then choose our ideal behavior or the best behavior to help them grow. Mm -hmm. not not yeah. to serve our feelings yeah and that's the, the the simple formula that we do expand on a bit more in the book because when you come about the position of how do we control our emotions mm -hmm. that's a big gig but we've had the help of um neuroscientist dr mark williams who wrote the connected species on that and a legend in organizational psychology called laurie skander mm -hmm. they both really lent in and helped us look at those drivers of emotions and so that's what we've then developed this concept of the core belief system. Yeah. And so that's a, another element of the book. And that makes me think a little bit of um, thinking of a, a Shingo conference. I had the opportunity to see uh, the late Stephen Covey, you know, yeah. speak at that event and to, to talk with him briefly. And, you know, he was, you know, one of the things he was talking about was, um, as you were calling it, a pause, Brad, you know, putting yeah. in that separation between stimulus and response. 
Yeah. You know, that we can paw, you know, we can try to get better at myself included pausing and then choosing how to react instead of mm. reacting in just a very instinctual reactive way. It's the secret. And you're right. Yeah. Mark. Like Stephen Covey is the, he, that seven habits where he brought that up, the, the gap between stimulus and response. That's the key. So what, what we're saying is that really that pause is critical. And I've got to admit for leaders listening to this, and I, this is what I do. It's my kids that I get the best practice with on this. Mm -hmm. So for me to practice it every day, I just practice it with my kids. Yeah. Because there's no no better situation to really lean into that. Um, but yeah. it is if you can nail the pause by controlling your emotions. Because if, if your emotions are riled, the pause is not going to happen. You know, and yeah. if you're if you're riled emotionally or you're riled even too positively emotionally, you're not going to be conscious because your yeah. conscious brain shuts down in that position and you're going to be following a habit. Now there'll be a percentage of the time that your habit actually is quite close to being the right behavior. Mm. but it will be a fair chunk of the time that your natural habit is not the right behavior to bring out the best in that person. Yeah. And, and on that, Mark, I think the best case study I've been so proud to write is on that super coach Wayne Bennett out of Australia. Like mm -hmm. this, this guy's a, he's been coaching for 50 years, won so many tournaments for so many teams, so many countries. He's won, he's won series for four different countries as a coach. Mm -hmm. And um, this is in rugby league, which is like yeah. gridiron without pads and a helmet. So I think a gridiron yeah. without pads and a helmet, pretty brutal. Yeah. And um, he is a master at understanding the person mm. right up front, building trust and psychological mm. safety, and then really being an adaptive leader mm. by adapting his style to suit them. Uh, and it's amazing. Yeah. So you answered the question that... Um, I hadn't quite gotten to yet of being an adaptive leader, but I think you drew that connection to situational leadership. And I, I'm not as familiar with the Ken Blanchard work, but I'll go back to Dr. Deming again, who I do remember very clearly writing that um, managers, leaders need to manage each person in their team, like the unique individual that they are. You know, so that makes a leader's job more difficult when you have to, oh, you actually have to, you have to get to know your employees and, and and what makes them or us tick and why um, everyone's not going to react to the same style of coaching or motivation, right? Yeah. And, and Mark, that's the thing I love about this world we're in. You know, all these concepts are not really new. You know, they go back to Deming in the 40s and Drucker way back or who's the guy that wrote to win How to Win Friends and Influence People? Carnegie. Dale Carnegie. You know, yeah. And I guess all of us as authors, we're repackaging and yeah. tweaking and adding bits to it. Yeah. But it's funny that, like, humans are humans, aren't we? Like, it, I don't think it matters if it's the 1930s, 40s, or now. Mm -hmm. It just comes down to organizations or a connection of humans and things. Yeah. And the more th that you can really help get the best out of all those humans and things to by really growing them, that's the secret source in an aligned way, you know, yeah. with purpose and culture and strategy mm -hmm. and which is where I love being able to write this book because it's the things that hang around lean that make it all work you know there's so many beautiful tools and techniques and lean they're wonderful yeah but it's all this stuff that actually makes it work and sustain mm -hmm. um which is what's so beautiful about it really but once yeah. leaders and organizations can really lean into this it helps them put effort into a direction that truly gets results. Whereas so much effort's gone mm -hmm. into agile, lean, when you're just tools focused and so much mm -hmm. money only to have it just drift backwards to well, yeah. pretty well what it was, you know? Yeah. Well, think of what happens when an organization copies tools or methods. I mean, there, there are many stories about copying an and on cord system yeah. to Toyota. You can buy the cords, the lights that that go off the chimes like none of that is proprietary technology to toyota i mean maybe yeah. they've cobbled a few things together right but you can go and buy um equipment like that but then the factories that have installed that equipment and then um without psychological safety for the employees when they get yelled at and blamed and punished for daring to pull that cord they learn not to pull the cord yeah. Yeah, you know, so the problem the problem's not the employee or 
I, I know if you were to take somebody from a Toyota plant and um, put them in a, a different environment without that same leadership style and culture and psychological safety, that same person who out of reflex would reach up and pull the and on cord at a to Toyota plant would probably also learn quickly, no, uh, don't do it here. <laughs> it's some other workplace. I think, Mark, a lot of um, a lot of ex Toyota people become consultants in Ling, you know, and I know a lot of them struggle because uh -huh. they don't understand the power of the culture they had through leadership. And a lot of them will go into an organization and say, let's just put the end on cord in and just put 5S in, and then it doesn't work and it causes grief and all sorts of carnages going on. And what they don't understand because they were oblivious to it because they lived it, they were part of that culture. They, they didn't, it's like they don't. A lot of them don't properly understand that. Like mm -hmm. you're trying to do something in a place that does not have the culture that you had, the leadership shadow yeah. that you had at Toyota. You know, you've got to get that right and right. work on that. And then you can start really getting everything else to start to get results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. Um, Stephen, what, what are some of your thoughts on, you know, if we aspire to be an adaptive leader, a situational leader, what are some of the things that people can do to develop that ability? I think, um, you know, it, it certainly, if, you know, we, it starts with, you know, the format, I think, that we have in the book. And we, uh, Brad mentioned earlier around uh, James Kerr's uh, legacy. Um, and the, 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 the free, for the listeners that don't know, it's probably one of my favorite books, leadership books of all time. Um, very passionate about it. It is the 15 principles of the New Zealand All Blacks. Uh, again, another type of rugby. It's a the, the proper rugby, as I say, not the rugby league. As meant because I'm a rugby union <laughs> oh, fan. Come on, come on. Um, <laughs> um, but it's how they sustained a high level of performance and culture um, over over many many years. Uh, and you know, they they start with 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 what's called character. Um, and the Sydney Swans are another AFL uh, football team here and. Australia, they have a, 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 a term called no dickheads, and excuse the term, yeah. but that essentially, that, that essentially means you want, you want good people on your team. You want people who have really sound, um, you know, have your back at all times. They're not white hunters. They're not going to be passive aggressive people. They're going to, you know, be with you, you know, no, through thick and thin. Um, and they're good people that, you know, good, good people make good, good employees uh, and good employees make good customer experience for your, for your customers and shareholders. Yeah. And um, the next thing is around behaviors, right? You need, you need ideal behaviors. And, you know, when you talk about, this, you know, when you read the book, you'll, you'll clearly see that ideal behaviors uh, drive ideal results, right? So how do you have, create ideal behaviors and also measure those behaviors through your, through your organization? And the next component is vulnerability. You know, having leaders that are vulnerable and not, not you know, not afraid to 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 say that they've got they they're uh, okay to fail, and you know they don't have all the answers. So, being that vulnerable, and I got talk into about my own personal story on that one, which I won't go into today, but uh, it gets quite deep and meaningful because I went to a very low place in my career, and, and that vulnerability when I started to show vulnerability uh, mm. and speak to speak to my teams about my scenario. It, it almost, you know, created a, a state of psychological safety, and they they almost seen saw they then saw me as human, right. uh, and not as a not as a leader. So they their performance lifted the minute that I started to show my vulnerability, which which is why that uh, piece is in the in the formula. And then the the interference, which we spoke about earlier. So I think as any leader, is even just focusing in on on those that formula will try and get them to will will help them to get to really understand as brad said the context and the scenario surrounding that individual and then look to work towards how do they actually put support mechanisms and help that individual through through to you know help them through to becoming a performing high performing individual um, mm -hmm. so that's that's one thing and then you know looking at you know development systems how do you create talent from and develop your people through their two potentials. So I think you know there's 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 lots of things you could do, but looking at those particular two things will, will be a good start. And you know, there's many hints and tips through the book. So um, you know uh, there's, there's different systems that you could use, but but they'd, they'd be the main two that I would I would focus in on. Yeah. Well, again, we've been joined by uh, Brad Jevons and uh, Stephen Dargan. 
Uh, the book is Leading Excellence, Five Hats of the Adaptive Leader. Um, I, I, I know I'll get an opportunity um, shortly. I haven't had a chance to read the book. So I've, I've, I've got to ask because I, I don't know. And for the listener, um, don't blame me for, for, for not prepping on this. I figure I could, I, I didn't have the chance and I could ask it here. What are the five hats <laughs> referenced yes, in the I subtitle? So what we've done with the five hats, Mark, is just look to bring it back to five simple things. So the first one is uh, wear the inspire hat, which is a lot what Stephen's talking about. You know, how do you understand someone's purpose and direction and their goals and their values? And then we call it the core belief system, you know, their core. And then how do you connect that to the organizations and does it align and is, you know, how does it line up for the organization's core? You know, the organization's purpose and values and principles or behaviors. And then the next hat is tr the training hat. Like we believe mm -hmm. leaders as trainers. You know, if you're going to be a leader who serves the growth of others, well, we'll key part of that is training. How well do we train? You know, so if you're looking at, if you're looking at the person and considering the context around them and you're like, they're new, they just really don't know. We haven't trained them and they're in a pretty good space emotionally. So potentially I I've just got to train them, mm -hmm. you know. So that's the training hat. And then the next hat is the support hat. So this is that, again, links back to a lot what Stephen's saying, you know, when that emotional position's in play, understanding those internal and external factors that can be impacting them and being really good at active listening and empathy and even vulnerability to lean in on that. The next hat, of course, is the coaching hat that everyone, there's so many books written on coaching, but I guess what we've looked at with the five hats, we think there's more than just coaching, that to be a truly great leader who leads excellence and the coaching hat is very important because that gets people to think that gets people to find their own way and really really grow it's like the superpower mm -hmm. um and then the final hat is actually we got the direct hat we, we do feel there's a place to be direct you know safety mm -hmm. situation you, right. you don't coach in a safety situation you just get the person out of the way mm -hmm. or get the thing out of the way and contain it but also if you do see your culture being broken in a massive way, you don't walk past it. You mm. may be more direct in that situation and actually, you know, go straight at the situation and open up the conversation. And so they're the, they're the five hats that when we say, look, it's about being a leader who serves the growth of others rather than yourself. To do that, you've got to be really skilled at pausing, staying in a good emotional state, pausing, considering the person, the context surrounding them, and then what we've provided for is these five hats that we believe if you can build your capability mm -hmm. in these five areas. And I guess as a leader, when you're looking at it, you'll be stronger in some and not so strong in others. And that's where it's not like you've got to build everything at once. Mm -hmm. It might be like, well, I, I'm outsourcing training at the minute. I'm getting the train department to do it all or someone else. And really, it's not effective, mm -hmm. right? Maybe I need to do a train the trainer course and build my capability as a trainer. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's where the five hats comes in, just to really simplify and put it all together. And we feel that the hat concept, although it's been used before by mm -hmm. many, we just feel it's a great analogy, you know, because you need to be able to swap and change between these hats. Well, which mm -hmm. really, Dags, you brought that thought to us, mate. I, I think it's, I'll just hand over to you for a second because I think it's something you've always used in your leadership language. Yeah, it's, it's, it's again, it's back to that understanding the environment um, and, you know, pausing and reflecting and going, okay, is because again, back to the Edward Demings, I think he's one of my favorite quotes, don't blame people, blame process. So how do we, how do we look at the surrounding environment of that individual and select the right hat? Uh, first, first take check of our emotions and get our emotions in check first. And, and you know, you've got to do this sometimes in a split, split second mark. So it, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, but but that's the learning as a leader is you, you, you practice and you know as Brad says practice on his kids um, it takes a lot of time and practice to do it especially in today's world of VUCA it's 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 fast paced and you know leaders are expected to make decisions and, and react very quickly so uh, the the hats you know analogy give, gives them that little tool to be able to go right pause have it think what's my emotions and then what's the understanding what's the interference or environment look like before before making that reaction um yeah and vuca for those who don't who don't know it and i'm struggling with it at the moment um so, volatile, so volatile uncertainty complex. uh, complexity and ambiguity ah that, that I, I got hung up on the a ambiguity yeah, ambiguity, yeah. 
And, and you know, you know, you know, Brad talks about 1930s. You know, for leaders are dealing with a whole new realm of of challenges these days with social media. You've got, you know, entry level. Uh, I forget what gen we're in now, Mark. Um, I'm showing my age now, but you know, the 20, 19, 20, 21 year olds coming into the workforce, their whole world is different, right? They communicate through text and social media. So, how does a leader adapt? to yeah. dealing with that, you know, face to face and, you know, don't assume as well, you know, when I, when I was a leader of an organization previously, I, I, I assumed that everyone knew how to do emails. Mm. That generation doesn't necessarily know how to do emails, you know, it's, it's just as basic as that. So it's just the leader has to continually look to evolve. Yeah. It's, yeah. It is challenging. It's, it's not, leadership is not easy. Mm -hmm. no. It's a privilege. It's a privilege, mm -hmm. but it's not easy. Yeah. It's well said. So, um, we talk about these five hats, you know, uh, Brad and, and, and Dargs. I'm going to call you Dargs now. I feel like we, <laughs> we've gotten to know each other here. Um, that uh, you're, you're going to do, I'm sure, more podcasts or more webinars. And like, you've got to get yourself the hats, like put on the actual hats. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. That's a definite step. That's a definite that's step. A, that's an improvement opportunity, Mark. <laughs> It's five hats. That's doable. Uh, five hats for each of you. So, um, yeah, I'm excited uh, about the book. Um, you know, uh, congratulations to you, or uh, you know, at least on on the progress so far. I know you still have work to do, but I, I know you'll get that over the finish line. And I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's going to um, really have a good impact. Thanks so much, Mark. Really appreciate it, mate. And. Thanks for all the work you do with the books you write too, mate. Like it's, I guess we're all just trying to get the knowledge out there and help people mm -hmm. create that better outcome, mate. So thank yeah. you for for having us on. Yeah, thank you, thank you both for being here. Um, and Dargs, I wouldn't know it was your first podcast. So I'm going to tell the listener <laughs> that now because they'll be surprised too. This, like I said, the first yeah. of many. But thank you for uh, being here and uh, being with me in the audience today. Yeah, I really appreciate it, Mark, and thanks to all your listeners as well. Thank you. Yeah.